So about Dean Spade, who will be um, presenting a lecture entitled Fight to Win, Critical Trans Resistance in Scary Times. Dean Spade is an associate professor at Seattle University School of Law, where he teaches administrative law, poverty law, and law of social movements. Um, prior to joining the faculty of Seattle University, Dean was a Williams Institute Law Teaching Fellow at UCLA Law School and Harvard Law School, teaching classes related to sexual orientation and gender identity law and law and social movements. In 2002, Dean founded the Silvia Rivera Law Project, a nonprofit law project collective that provides free legal services to transgender, intersex, and gender nonconforming people who are low income and or people of color. Um, the Silvia Rivera Law Project also engages in litigation, policy reform, and public education on issues affecting these communities. It operates in the collective governance model, prioritizing the governance and leadership of trans, intersex, and gender nonconforming people. From 1998 to 2006, Dean co-edited the paper and online uh, magazine, Make. Dean is currently the co-editor of the online journal, Enough, which focuses on the personal politics of wealth distribution. As you know, Dean is a very, very busy person, and we are so honored um, to have him here at Highline today. So can y'all please give Dean Spade a warm welcome? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that generous introduction. I'm super glad to be at Highline for the first time. I feel so lucky to be invited. Very grateful to Doris and Dominique and everybody who's been working on this week of events, um, which sounds like it's been pretty fabulous. Um, sounds like good work happening on this campus. Um, so yeah, I um, I want to just spend this time thinking a little bit with you all about, I think, a lot of the questions that we're all struggling with about kind of like <laughs> these really intense times we're living in where the world really locally and all over feels like it's on fire and literally is on fire and underwater and um, where so many people we love are in danger and where we feel different kinds of danger, um, uh, really getting close to different communities in, in, in old and new ways. Um, and there's a lot of questions that just about like kind of how do we think about what's going on? What do we do? How, does, how do we think about the connection between like what queer and trans politics often gets framed as and like the other urgent things going on in our lives? Um, and how does that politics get like lived and, and, and done as resistance by our social movements? So that's a kind of some of the themes I wanna think about with you all. I'm super curious to hear what you think. Let's see what my slides say. <laughs> okay, I wanted to start um, just with, you know, I know people come to thinking about um, trans politics in different ways, and I don't know how big the trans community is on this campus, so I just wanted to share a little bit about like, how I think about trans politics in the most basic level um, and what leads me to my work. As Doris mentioned, I, um, you know, I'm a poverty lawyer, and um, my work has been a lot about supporting trans people who are living in poverty, living with criminalization. So some of the kinds of issues that make trans people's lives, like, really short and, um, and, and really embattled are some of these things I have listed up here. Like um, a lot of people have experienced family rejection and don't have um, like the kind of basic safety net that can sometimes exist for some people within family. People experience a lot of exclusion um, in employment and educational situations. Um, people have poverty, being born into poverty and also becoming increasingly poor because of um, those kinds of conditions. Um, really high numbers of trans people are homeless and, um, and vulnerable to police violence, which of course we know is targeted towards people of color, indigenous people, and poor people, people with disabilities. Um, huge numbers of trans people disproportionately end up in the um, criminal punishment system and facing immigration consequences, right? Those things often go together um, and are really um, intertwined in our society. So the, the way, when I think about trans politics, I think about a politics that needs to respond to that. That's what I, I wanted to kind of center that. So for me, trans politics is centrally about racial and economic justice um, and disability justice and migrant justice, all of those pieces, because it's about the kind of worst conditions facing trans populations, which are all about um, structures of law, policy, and social relations that produce early death um, because of kind of this and, and a much more complex set of um, circumstances that we could trace. So that's just like, just to give you a basic understanding so that we're on the same page about what I mean trans politics is even supposed to be trying to work on. Um, in the United States, we have a really wild mythology that, we, that is so powerful that we often aren't aware it's happening. And the myth is that 
Um, if you want to change people's lives, you need to change the law. We really love the fantasy that the legal system is what changes people's lives. And the way we tell that story in the US is often a story about anti-black racism. We often tell a story about how there used to be anti-black racism in the United States, and there was chattel slavery, there was the Jim Crow system of apartheid, and that those things were resolved either by you know, constitutional amendments or by civil rights laws, and that now we're living in this new time where there's not anti-black racism, and we have a, had a black president, and so therefore, all is well. This is like a story we love to tell in the United States, and it's a story, this government of the United States, I hope I'm not causing these noises, but I might be, um, uh, it's a story the United States tells about itself, right? It's a story about how we are a place of freedom where our laws are just, and if you just interpret the Constitution right, you'll get justice will fall out of it, even though it's a document written by slave owners and um, people who were here to commit genocide against indigenous people, right? That fantasy and that, and especially I work in a law school, so that fantasy is like huge, right? It's like the Constitution is like this hallowed, you know, glittery, special thing from God, when really it's just like a piece of, you know, of law written by people. Um, that really captures its historical moment. But this, this fantasy is a big one, and the reason I bring it up is because um, this fantasy has really been applied. It's, it's a story that is very centrally told about anti-black racism, but it's often applied then to any vulnerable group seeking freedom. So it's a story that we're then told is supposed to answer what trans people need or what queer people need. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, no. Okay. So this myth, you know, part of it is a myth that racism is over and was resolved by law. That's centrally this myth. But it's also a myth that sexism is over and was resolved by law, right? Like this story that, of course, now everybody's fine because we have Title VII and sexism is illegal, therefore it's fine. And people are um, equal, but even though we know that in reality, you know, um, women still make less than men. We live in a culture of um, systemic sexual violence that's highly gendered. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, the material conditions we live under make it very clear that, that this is not true, but this mythology is very strong. We hear the same story, ableism is over. We had the um, you know, Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act before that. Nobody's allowed to complain, everything's fine. I mean, this is a story we hear a lot, right? And the bottom line of that story is that if you're doing poorly in these systems, it's your fault, right? The story is telling us there is no systemic harm. You, it, it's you if you're doing poorly, you made bad choices, or you ha your community has bad morals, or you know, you're not working hard, all these stories, even though of course we all know that the hardest working people in the, in the society are those who make the least money, right? People who do childcare, who clean things, who deal with dangerous chemicals, right? Like the people who literally work the jobs that break their bodies are not compensated, right? But whatever, these, these myths are big. And this myth also has a silence in it, right? This, the, the myth never says, uh, material inequality will be resolved by law because we know that capitalism is the law, so it's not illegal to discriminate against poor people. You can just tell people, you can't come in here because you can't pay, right? So the, the myth also has like a silence about key forms of material inequality, and it has a silence about indigenous people, obviously, because settler colonialism and genocide is the law of this land, right? So this, this mythology about law is a big one, and I, I, I pause on it just because I think it's one that people just operate. It's like, your community's having a hard time, you guys need to go do some legislation or go bring a court case. Right? And we can see that actually that, that story, that arc, that, that those court cases and that legislation has resolved things is, is, a, is a mythological one that justifies an existing sexist, racist, um, colonial system, right? Ableist colonial system. So what, what we do know is that in the period that we've lived in where supposedly all of these kinds of inequality have become illegal in this period when you know supposedly the law fixed everything and now it's racism is illegal and sexism is illegal and ableism is illegal during this period you know starting from the civil rights era till now we've actually seen growing material inequality so the government told us all we were all equal but at the same time people work more than ever and have less pay right like wages stagnated i, I read something that said that people in the united states work a month more a year than they did in the 1950s and 60s like a month, there's only 12 months in a year, as I know you guys know. It's like really intense to think about working an entire month more a year, right? So people are working more than ever. I think a lot of us experience this, jobs that kind of go around the clock, um, intense demands on, um, on people's labor. Um, there's a really drastic growing racialized wealth divide, which you know people, were, I think a lot of people became more aware of the wealth gap um, and income gap when the phrase was popularized, the 99%. 
um, during um, the Occupy um, era, right? The idea that there's that there's such a severe concentration of wealth in this country, and one percent is kind of holding almost everything, and then. Um, most people have almost nothing or are deeply indebted. So that's, and that gap, which I think is, people talk less about how racialized and gendered that gap actually is. It's extremely racialized and gendered. We have, you know, this range of neoliberal economic policies, whether we're talking about trade agreements, free trade agreements like NAFTA um, or the proposed um, TPP, or whether we're talking about um, extensive complicated debt relations between like rich countries and poor countries that produce um, all kinds of effects that are worsening this global uh, wealth divide and worsening our, our domestic wealth divide, right? Where um, my, mom, my mom always said the rich are just getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, but that, that what she was capturing was really true, right? That we see things like um, the loss of union jobs, the moving offshore of a lot of manufacturing into places where people are also extremely exploited um, under like uh, really suppressed abilities to have labor laws in their own country as we see um, you know, increasing environmental harm from those industries. We see all these pieces coming together that are making our world more dangerous for us, making a few people a lot of money, and making most people a lot more desperate. At the same time, in the United States, we've seen consistent cuts to any kind of governmental support for poor people. We've already always been one of the worst countries in terms of this compared to all the other rich countries. I have some theories about how that relates to being a settler colonial country based in slavery. But the, um, you know, fundamentally, we've always had a really crappy, inadequate way of supporting any kind of um, people facing you know, severe poverty. And that's even gotten worse, especially in the last 20 years, where we've really seen cuts to those benefits, where you, I mean, you absolutely cannot get by on anything like the support that's available. And you just see cut after cut after cut, um, which puts more people into more desperate situations. Um, at the same time, we've had all of this kind of, you know, we're being told we're more equal than ever. We're seeing our actual lives get a lot harder and people more desperate. And then we see the drastic growth of the prison and immigration enforcement systems um, during this period, right? So we've, we now live in, you know, the United States, the most imprisoning country in the world. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. That system is intensely targeted towards indigenous people, people with disabilities, people of color, right? Very intensely. Um, and we've seen our um, immigration imprisonment system quadruple since 2001, right? And you know, I think a lot of us are following this, are seeing the ways in which um, administration after administration, including fully including the Obama administration, which you know, Obama was the most deporting president of all time, um, each administration is growing that immigration enforcement system drastically. Um, and so we're just seeing more and more people in our lives locked up in different ways, under surveillance in different ways, losing family members who are being disappeared into these systems in different ways, and all the ways that further impoverishes, impoverishes our, our communities and, um, and makes us vulnerable. Um, and all of this is happening amidst really huge um, intense wars, right? Like the war in Iraq, which I think has been declared over like several times, but is clearly still happening and still, a, you know, making a lot of money for particular private um, war profiteer co corporations and, you know, draining the coffers of, um, of the U.S. government and uh, putting, you know, just killing so many people. Those numbers aren't even reported by our media. It's like no one cares how long these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq go on and all of the so many other fronts where the US military um, is doing its harm. Sorry about this really bad news slide. <laughs> but the reason it's so important for me to, to kind of really frame this bad news is because what I want us to think about is why, is how we can understand why law and policy frameworks that we've been told will resolve issues for people like trans people who are vulnerable and struggling don't work and what um, is actually going on under the watch of this kind of supposed legal equality we've all been granted in the last half century. Um, so LGBT law in the United States has really focused on a set of reforms um, that are pretty limited, that are familiar to you. Anti-discrimination laws, hate crime laws, military service inclusion, and marriage. These have been kind of the menu of what we've been told gay rights or LGBT rights are or should be um, over the last 40 years. Um, and these reforms are just, you know, following this pattern I'm talking about, deeply, deeply inadequate and utterly fail to change the material conditions that LGBT people are facing, that I was talking about at the beginning, that trans people are facing, that vulnerable people are facing. Um, you know, these, these, these reforms tend to just do what, um, they actually tend to do more for making the government look good than for making people's lives change, right? Like something like anti-discrimination laws 
they say, we, we now protect you, nobody can you know, fire you for being um, gay or nobody can fire you for being a person of color or whatever. They say that racism is illegal or homophobia is illegal, but they're actually virtually unenforceable, right? If, like, we can talk about the law of this in more detail if you want to, but there's all these ways in which it's almost impossible to prove that anyone has not hired you or has fired you for this reason. People don't tend to win in court, and especially people who are in low wage, in the low wage sector, it's almost impossible to prove why you didn't get a job when you walked in and applied for it. You know, and yet you know that, like you know, often, right? They don't want people like who look like me working here. They don't that kind of thing. But there's a there's it's it, these are just like unless they write you a letter that's like, dear dean, we don't want trans people like you working here at Abercrombie and Fitch, and so you won't be working on our floor. You know, like it's, they don't write that letter usually. And actually, I've actually had cases where they do write a letter like that or something like that, and they st you still lose. Um, we can talk about that. Um, it's really, 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 really hard to win those kind of cases in court, in part because um, anti-discrimination law misunderstands actually how harm works, right? It imagines this like evil, terrible racist or transphobe who's like sitting there being like, you can't come in here, you can't work here, and who has these bad thoughts in their head and the rest of us are like, all fine and good. When in reality, th things like racism, transphobia, homophobia, distribute all of our life chances unevenly, right? So if you are a person of color in the United States, you're more likely to be breathing toxic air, drinking toxic water, um, you know, working in a more dangerous job, having less access to healthcare, all these things that are gonna end your life earlier that aren't about like some bad dude who wrote you a letter and said you're, you're not allowed to work here because you're whatever, right? Like that fantasy about anti-discrimination is really like the fantasy that is about these two bad, indiv this bad individual and the victim and the law will catch them and make it right. And that's not actually how what we might call oppression or subjection works. And so that's part of why it doesn't work and why it's unpro unprovable in so many ways. Hate crime laws, those are laws that like enhance the penalty if you attack or hurt somebody because or kill them because of their identity. So those laws basically are just about, they're not about preventing our deaths at all. They're maybe about having somebody else go to prison for longer which like in no way frees the people who are facing harm and actually like all other laws added to the criminal system ends up targeting people of color, people with disabilities, poor people. That's exactly how every law that gets added to the criminal arsenal does. It just empowers the prosecutor and that's what prosec where prosecution is pointed. So that's been a really ineffective piece. I, I have to talk briefly, at least about military inclusion, because talk about something that doesn't do much for the community impacted, but makes the institution look good. Right? It's like you see all these images of like gay service members kissing in their uniforms or like a proud trans soldier who just wants to serve and the story becomes, you know, about how this is our freedom, this is our liberation, this is our dignity. When in reality, serving the U.S. military is a really horrible, messed up job, right? Doing some of, you know, the U.S. military is, is the biggest source of violence in the world. And it's also the biggest polluter in the world. Right? And working there is terrible. Right? The rates of sexual violence towards people in, in the U.S. military are astronomical. And people who serve in the U.S. military are abandoned as veterans. Right? We, we know all this, the, the, the benefits are terrible. And rates of suicide are incredibly high and people are really traumatized by what they're being forced to do. Um, there's so many ways in which this is a terrible job that I don't want people in my community to have to do. You know, I don't want anyone who's trans to have to try to get that job to survive. That's not a real choice, you know? So, there's, so, that, so the whole, but the, but the kind of, the story where we place military service as this proud, wonderful thing, and then we put trans people or gay people in, as the kind of um, poster children for it, actually just makes the US military look like a site of liberation and inclusion, which it is absolutely nothing you know, of that sort. So that's a really complicated moment we're seeing right now, because like Trump doesn't want people, trans people to serve in the military. And it's like, well, neither do I. And I, you know, Trump's reasons are whatever they are, but the, but the idea that therefore that means the like liberatory position is to want US pe trans people to be in the US military, is that's like really off, that our politics are off. And this is part of what I want to talk about more broadly today is how do we think about a, a, a resistant trans politics or a queer politics that also like includes reality, right? And is like, and cares about like, you know, imperialism and cares about racism, right? And is trying to build like a vision of liberation that we actually could get excited about. Marriage, we could go into marriage. I'll just, we'll come back to it. There's, this, take too, this, this slide is taking too long. Um, okay, so basic pitfalls of reforms. This is like the, the summary of this that I want you all to grab, right? We don't want reforms that provide no material relief. So reforms that are just like, you know, we're gonna, pa this is a really good example. I spent a lot of time my, uh, in my life um, trying to uh, work on what's happening for queer and trans people inside US prisons. And one of the things people will say, you know, we'll be trying to, to think about how to like change things for people in prisons, like 
um, you know, primarily get them out, um, uh, and also like deal with like things like inadequate nutrition, inadequate healthcare, things like that. Um, and people will be like, well, how about if the prison created an anti-discrimination policy? Like, you know, that's like a, that's like a, has no material relief. Like, that's just like slapping a rainbow flag on like on a tank or on a prison, right? Like, it's just, a, it's just the idea. Putting something just, just like a fake idea on the outside, right? That kind of law and policy reform is really common. So that's one of our biggest concerns about reforms. We always want to be concerned whenever we're fighting for justice and somebody offers us a reform back and it's just like, they're going to change the wording, you know? about the same thing that's gonna keep eating your community alive, right? So that's like, that's something we always wanna be concerned about. Another one is relief that only reaches the least marginalized. So there's a really big history of this inside the whole realm we might call civil rights, but you also see this debate happening right now around immigration reform. One of the things that tends to happen is that people will propose reforms that are for the least marginalized of the group of, of people facing harm. They'll just try to, it's, some people call it creaming, creaming, you know, cause like skimming the cream off the top of the milk. Maybe you guys have never had non-homogenized dairy products, it's possible, but, um, you know, anyway. Uh, um, so, you know, the idea that, that it's like, who's the, who's the people inside the marginalized group who um, actually have the most access? We'll, let, we'll make sure a few of them get to go to college, or a few of them get to immigrate, or a few of them get to get the jobs, you know, that kind of thing. So that's one thing we can always be concerned about is like, is there this reform that's only reaching the least marginalized of the affected group? That's like another common pitfall. A third pitfall is what I was talking about with the military and all these things where you get a, just a change in the window dressing, just a change on the cover, right? You get the legitimization of the harmful systems and sometimes it's expansion. So the you know, so it's like, oh yeah, the police are wonderful. They, they have a hate crimes law. They're here, they're here to protect LGBT people. It's like, that's not what the police are here to do. They're here to target and destroy communities of color. That's what they've been here for since they were invented, you know? Um, or the military is this great place that's, that's here to, you know, they're, they're gonna invade Afghanistan to save the women of Afghanistan. That was like the rationale that Barbara Bush lectured us all on in 2000 something. Um, you know, and that, that idea that, 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 the, that the police or the military or whatever it is that is the, these sort of um, apparatuses of violence that our, that our movements have targeted and exposed, that those things actually are like, legitimate because then they take on our names. This happens a lot, you know, I work at a law school and we have the prosecutor's office is always at the law school promoting itself, right, and, and as a society of justice. And one of the ways they like to do that is by saying that like they, the, prose the role of prosecution is to save women. That's like a really strong talking point of like policing and prosecution systems is that they exist to stop gender violence. When in reality, of course, the police are a huge site of gender violence, right? The police are major perpetrators of gender violence. Prisons are, and jails are places where people experience high, high levels of sexual violence and assault. And policing and imprisonment have not been shown to actually deter or prevent gender violence. They don't. Gender violence is super common in all of our lives. People most likely to harm us are people we know, like people in our families, our partners, our coworkers. And policing and imprisonment just like has failed to in any way disrupt that. But it has, adding a bunch of um, laws that criminalize gender violence has actually just been more in the arsenal for adding a lot more communities of color into the prison system, right? So it's really complicated to really face like that things that are that we've been told are good and will help us like aren't working, right? And actually our our um, our PR, our good PR for those systems. I mean, when you look at shows like um, all the Law and Order shows that always portray like these evil criminals who need to be caught by these brilliant police and then prosecuted by these brilliant you know, prosecutors, like all of that is, you know, propaganda for a system that actually has nothing to do with keeping the most dangerous people in prison and, this, and everybody outside safe, right? In reality, the most dangerous people in the United States are bankers, police, soldiers, politicians. Those people are the people who make decisions that are like shortening all of our lives. Those are people who, who decide to not invest in good evacuation routes. Those are people who decide to defund the firefighting. You know, those are people who decide that this amount of pollution is fine, even though it's going to produce terminal cancers and a huge set of people in a particular community, right? Like, anyway, you get what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> the other piece of it is when it not doesn't just it doesn't just you know legitimize a harmful system, but it actually expands it, right? Like that's like hate crime laws are an example of that. So it, not only it doesn't not only does it make the, the oh the police are good they protect LGBT people, but also it gives the prosecutor like more punishing power to be, put people away for longer. Right, so that's really dangerous, right? Or anything that, you know, we see this debate sometimes about, um, oh, a really good example of this is um, the, the movement against domestic violence in the United States um, at, 
it, you know, as it turned more t uh, into having like a wing of it that became very visible and strong that really collaborated with the criminal justice system and where especially kind of like a lot of white leaders in that movement um, h helped it turn towards being really focused on increasing criminal penalties, they passed laws for mandatory arrests where if the cops are called for a DV to someone's house, they have to arrest somebody. And this idea makes sense if you really trust the police, so it made a lot more sense to white women than it made to women of color, indigenous women, and immigrant women. Um, and so then the police would come and they often arrest both people or they often arrest whoever's browner or they arrest whoever's disabled or they arrest whoever's queer or trans or all those things, right? All the normal things they see as dangerous, suspicious, all, that all, through all their racist, transphobic, ableist lenses that are very common, right? That, we, that are well documented. And so there's been now decades of these mandatory arrest laws and finally even the most mainstream domestic violence agencies and organizations are saying, you know what, mandatory arrest laws don't work. They actually don't work. They didn't make women safer from domestic violence. They just increased policing and, and escalated situations. The cops show up and they escalate, right? And the family in general is probably in more chaos and more danger often than it was um, before the cops randomly decided to arrest everybody or anybody that they you know, assessed right then. And so we're seeing this kind of, this, this long history of the ways in which these um, reforms that expand harmful systems um, uh, you know, w decades in, we're like, wow, that really didn't keep people safer. And then there's lots that I think are not sufficiently, have not been sufficiently assessed. But mandatory arrest is one of the, one of the ones where we can see actually finally there's some um, more awareness about that. And lastly, another pitfall of reform we always want to look for is, is reforms that divide people into deserving and undeserving, right? So the idea that, um, you know, there's good immigrants and bad immigrants. We want to find relief for the immigrants who go to college, but not relief for any immigrant who's ever had contact with the policing and prison system, right? Fundamentally, that's already going to sort people out in a bunch of really problematic ways. It's going to sort people out around class, who happen to have more access to college and who didn't. It could sort people out around skin tone, or likely, or if you live in a more policed neighborhood, all the things that might lead you to more likely to contact with the police, right? Because we know that policing isn't, as I said, related to dangerousness. It's not related to your behavior, right? White people do more drugs than black people, but black people go to prison more for drugs than white people. Right? Like, it's like policing and danger, or policing and behavior have nothing to do with each other. So if we ever attach deservingness to criminal, having a criminal record, we're already, you know, we're making a recipe for creating an undeservingness category that's very racialized, um, class, often has to do with disability. And so you see that heavily in the, in the, um, in the, my, in the migrant justice question, right? You see right now that framing of, of who's a good immigrant and who's a bad immigrant, like very strongly. And you see people in that movement really brilliantly trying to push back on that. Maybe you guys have followed like this long-term, not one more deportation campaign. And that campaign was a response to the idea of creating reforms that would only let a small number of people immigrate who were considered deserving. And the not one more deportation campaign was like, no nobody should be deported, right? And so they've really reframed the debate. But that's, even within social movements, right, we get these major debates about kind of what are good reforms, what are good tactics, and it, in so many of our movements, we see this with deserving or undeserving. So you see this too, like during, you know, you guys have been following all this drama about trans people using bathrooms and the bathroom bills all around the country. And then you'd see these memes go around and it would have a picture of like a really passing white trans person, like let's say a white trans man, it would be like, he should get to use the men's bathroom, right? Like, because he looks right, right? But the, but the main people who get harassed and bullied and beaten and um, sometimes killed in bathrooms are trans people who are low income or homeless or people of color who people don't think look feminine or masculine enough. So kind of creating this idea of who's the, the good trans person that you wouldn't mind having in the bathroom doesn't actually help with the vulnerable people, right? But this kind of deserving undeserving problem is a really common one. And it comes from living in a society full of hierarchies where then we get this idea that we should have an advocacy strategy where we're like, no, we promise we're good please be nice to us, give us rights, and then we define good just the way the society has been, which is whiteness, able-bodiedness, normativity, class stuff, or whatever, all that stuff that we, all the stuff we already think sounds good, you know? Instead of criticizing, like, wait, why is that, why are those people, like, why are some people disposable and other people's lives matter? Like, no, right? So these kind of pitfalls of reforms are really big ones that we have to keep our eyes on as activists, trying to think about how to, like, change make change that's meaningful, right? And for me, as somebody trying to do work around building justice for trans people, these reforms are like, like let's not just step into these same holes again, you know? Like let's not just make reforms that don't work, right? But of course, 
I'm in a, debates with people inside my own movement about whether or not things that, that they want to do, like advocate really hardcore for transmilitary inclusion, is falling into the pitfalls, right? So that, those debates matter, and it, that's, it matters um, to me to be trying to build a politics based in like real solidarity and like really a strong commitment to like anti-imperialism, anti-racism, et cetera. So it's just some examples of the pitfalls of reforms. Maybe you guys have seen these horrible stickers that are all over Seattle. The police created this sticker that's like, businesses are supposed to put in their windows. Hey, look, this is a safe place. If, you, if something happens to you, we'll call the cops, right? So this is a police PR campaign that uses a symbol from the LGBT movement, the rainbow flag, to pr spread propaganda for the Seattle police, right? This is, are you, you follow me with this kind of thing? Like how this works, right? This is a comic that I think is, captures this as well. Right, this, the idea that, oh, the w women can be active duty or active combat or whatever it's called now. This is so amazing. Like, oh, the U.S. military is this wonderful site of gender justice. This, does this matter to the people who are the targets of the U.S. military? And also, is this really real for women inside the U.S. military who experience such immense rates of sexual violence? And after the Orlando massacre, the NYPD put out this rainbow cop car, right? You should all just be like, I hope inside you're, it's killing you to see this, right? Okay, um, right, I mean, the, the NYPD is, is, is such a massive force of racialized, homophobic, and transphobic violence. So the idea that they would be, that they get to kind of like use our rainbow to make their, their, their policing efforts look just or, you know, liberally inclusive or something. Okay, so we're living through this time in trans politics that we could call mainstreaming, where we're seeing, you know, Caitlin's a really good image for this, right? We're seeing new forms of visibility, right? Um, that, and conditional acceptance, right? An idea of deployment of deserving figures. Caitlin, she's so pretty, trans people are okay, you know, whatever, right? She's a Republican, yay. Like, this kind of like, you know, lifting up of images of trans people that don't represent at all who most people are or what pe most people's lives are like and what they're facing and that produce an idea of kind of deservingness or what the qualities of deservingness would be, which would be like, if you can be the perfect image of white femininity, then maybe you might be tolerably accepted. What comes with this is also a set of recuperative reform proposals, like the ones I've been talking about. Even when your proposals succeed, the harm and violence against your communities stays the same or worsens, right? So as we've seen, these legal equality reforms have changed over the last 50 years in the United States, and yet actual violence against communities of color has worsened, right? The actual, more people in the United States think they're not racist, but more people of color than ever are locked up in cages. So, you know, we gotta like somehow connect. Um, and then often you also get backlashes, right? So we've seen a lot of backlashes that, um, already with, uh, recently with trans stuff. So the questions that you know, I think are vital for trans activists, but we could apply this to other movements to ask, always related to my pitfalls concerns, does it provide actual material relief? Does it leave out an especially marginalized part of that affected group? So this, this reform will help people as long as they're documented, or this reform will help people as long as they don't have any history of criminal activity. You know, like, that's a, those are classic reform dilemmas, people, cutting people out. So if, there, if it's doing that, there's no chance it's actually building your power or freedom. Does it legitimize or expand a system that we're trying to dismantle? So does it try to make the military look good, or the cops look good, or whatever, some corporation? Um, and does it mobilize the most affected for ongoing struggle? So it doesn't just matter what we're fighting for, it also matters how we fight for it, right? Like, di did the fight itself bring people together to build their leadership and build their, like, actual power, right? So that maybe it's like an incremental fight, but it's building us to the next fight and the next fight and the next fight, right? We can talk more about that. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit of this, because I just have too much going on um, for our time. Um, you know, I have, what these slides are that I'm skipping are different. I'm interested in what other criteria other, other thinkers and activists are using to think about um, how to decide whether something is actually liberatory or not. And, I, and I'll, we can come back to other ones if you want to during Q&A, but you know, Audre Lorde asked this question that is so powerful to me. In what way do I contribute to the subjugation of any part of those I call my people? So that question for me, right, is like, it's so fundamental. It's like, am I asking for acceptance for a set of deserving trans people conditioned on leaving another set of trans people behind or making them more endangered, right? Or with any group of people I'm part of, right? Is, is, anything, is anything about what I, the reforms I'm asking for going to further endanger or leave out another part of the group that I call my people? Because if we're not together as people, we're definitely not actually building power. We're building power for the systems that harm us, not for us. It's this trick, it's a brilliant trick. It's been working on us for decades, right? 
Um, OK, I know, I know that I'm really trying to keep to Doris's framework. I let people out in four minutes. So I just want to talk about some act, like very concrete strategies, and then we, will, we can go into details about these concrete strategies more um, during the Q&A, if you can stay. Um, so one key set of strategies is all the politicized survival work, um, or what I also often call mutual aid work. Um, some people call it like, um, self-help work, work that's about um, Work that's about helping each other survive these conditions. This is like a vital kind of work we have to do, which is about like how do we provide housing, healthcare, education for each other? How do we actually get what we need to survive? Right? There's a lot of amazing work like this happening in our own region. Right? Work where people are supporting each other with the basics. Um, and a lot of this work is about supporting people who are in the most dangerous conditions. Um, so I'm thinking about like all the work that goes on around the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma. All the, the you know you can become a pen pal to a person who's imprisoned there. You can go. Um, every weekend to protest outside, you can connect to the, to the families of people in prison there and support them. All of that work that's about like helping people survive right now who are in these situations. Um, it's also about you know direct work for people for support for people with disabilities. About accompaniment projects like projects where people go with each other to scary court hearings they have to do to welfare hearings. There's like a project in Tennessee where people go with uh, with other trans people to doctor's appointments. Like just anything that's about us not having to go through these brutal systems by ourselves. You know, it, it makes such a huge difference. So politicized survival work is like a vital category. I'd love to talk more about that to, to all of you. The other, another piece of the work is dismantling work, which is all the work to stop this stuff from growing and to shrink it, right? So I, maybe some of you have been involved in the campaign to stop the new youth jail from being built in King County. I'm happy to tell you more about that campaign if you'd like to get involved. There's an event happening this coming Sunday at Washington Hall, 5.30. I would love to go to that event with you. Um, all the work that's about stopping new, new ones from being built, that's about tearing down the existing ones, let's m divert money away from policing and towards you know, um, income support and childcare and all the things people actually need to be safe. Um, all the work to block deportations, I'm sure some of you have, been, have followed the work people have done blocking the deportation buses, leaving the detention center in Tacoma, like literally stopping deportations. One of my favorite um, examples of this ever was when a group called No One Is Illegal um, shut down the entire international terminal at the Vancouver airport. 2,000 people showed up to stop the deportation of this guy, Libar Singh, in 2008. An amazing story. There's a really cool video of it on YouTube. Um, block, blocking public housing closures. All these pieces that are about just literally like escalating tactics, you know, stopping pipelines, right? That obviously the, the efforts to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline, which include both like the incredible gatherings and, and that kind of work at Standing Rock, but also the, the sabotage of the pipeline that's gone on since that, right? All of that work is vital. And the third piece of work um, in my one minute um, is is the work that's building the world that we actually want and preparing for and dealing with the existing and coming disasters, which I think are like more apparent to us than ever. And that work includes things like, we know the police don't work to make us safe. They, we know that they often bring more danger when we call them or when someone calls them. So we have to come up with systems that actually do work for making us safe. How do we deal with conflict in our communities? Because we have a lot of conflict in our communities. We hurt each other a lot. Most of us are connected to family violence or dating violence in some way. We know this stuff is really in us, in our communities. So we need other methods of responding. I could share with you a lot of really amazing models of that that are being worked on in our own region. Um, another example is just building more care and independency, interdependency. Like how do we actually build real support systems for people with disabilities in our communities, for people with kids? Like how do we actually build the world we'd want to live in instead of the one where people are just like abandoned? You know, what if, what if you are taking care of your grandmother and they've closed the benefits for elder care, elder daycare in, in Washington State? Like, what do you do? Like, we need actually to have our own systems because we can't count on government systems to do that. Um, doing deep political education through participation, so people actually being involved in stuff. I think this is really big. I'd love to talk about this with you all during the Q&A, like how we're being told that the only way to participate is by posting things online and how that really, really is very, it's a very good demobilizing strategy for us. So to actually participate in political work, which means like being part of something where people like do stuff together to stop things or to help each other, like that, we learn so much about the actual conditions we live in by doing that. And then we're also more prepared to respond, right, when violence and disaster is happening. And doing all of this from a framework that is really central that I also would love to talk to you all more about, which is a framework that says that nobody is disposable. A framework that really suggests that nobody is a nobody. Like, what if you really took that seriously? You know, like that is like a framework that is really hard to capture under the political conditions we live under. We're constantly making each other into nobodies. We're constantly trying to figure out who's important. You know, I always think about this with like Angela Davis comes to speak at your school and everybody wants to shake Angela Davis's hand, but nobody wants to write a letter to a prisoner. 
You know what I mean? Like, how do we move to a framework where we actually think everybody matters, like really matters? Like, we have to all come along together. And that really happens, in my opinion, through certain kinds of participation. And it's 2.21, and so we'll have our break. <laughs>